Hey guys, my name is Matthew and I'm really excited for today's interview with author Eric Mykrans. He wrote The Reincarnationist Papers and that book is being turned into the movie Infinite starring Mark Wahlberg later on this year. In this interview, Eric gives us tons of tips and helpful hints on writing, some insight into the book itself, and lots of interesting tidbits surrounding the writing process and editing and publishing. Um, if you're interested in any of those things at all, uh, feel free to jump in or marketing or some of that in there as well. This is going to be an awesome interview. I think you guys are going to love it. Let's get right to it. Hey guys, so we're really excited to have Eric Mykrans on the show today. He's written The Reincarnationist Papers, which is just an excellent book. I highly recommend it. Um, we'll talk more about that in just a little bit, but uh, Eric, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thanks for thanks for having me, Matthew. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a pleasure course. to hear that great feedback on your on your read of the Reincarnations papers. Yeah, I absolutely love the book. Uh, you know, one of the things that really stuck out to me in the book, and, and we'll we'll get a chance to talk a lot more about all this stuff, but um, I really love the descriptions in the book in particular. There's one scene where I knew I was I was like, you know, occasionally you don't finish a book, but I knew I was going to finish it whenever we got to the fire that happens relatively early in the book, and the descriptions there and some of the language used, um, I was I was hooked. I was ready to keep finishing that book, and I hardly put it down again after that <laughs> nice i love hearing that yeah that was a real fun scene to write and, and an important scene to write because fire actually ends up being sort of like a character in the book and so it was really important to get that one right thanks matthew yeah well why don't you um tell us a little bit about the reincarnationist papers why should people go pick it up what's it about yeah so thanks so the reincarnationist papers it's uh soon to be the movie infinite with mark Wahlberg, dylan o'brien and she would tell edgy for should be out this summer uh, it's the story of a troubled young man in los angeles who is haunted by memories of two past lives and when i say two past lives i mean total recall he remembers the languages the skills all of the experiences the love, the losses, everything from two people that lived before him in time. And he thinks that he's alone in this world, which is really sort of a tough existence, until he accidentally stumbles onto a secret society of others that are like him. And these guys have been uh, associating with one another century over century and have actually been sort of secret drivers to history. And we sort of discover that in book one, but we'll get into that more in books two and three in the series. Yeah, I'm so excited that there are more books coming out because uh, I'm definitely going to want to read those when they come out. Um, well. I guess uh, before we get into too much about this book specifically, uh, you know, what we're talking about today is kind of the process. Like, what does it look like to write yeah. a book from kind of origin? You've got this idea um, all the way through to publishing and in your case, even beyond because you've gotten, you know, the movie is coming out, which is super exciting. Um, yeah. So I guess, can you tell us a little bit about your writing background? What, you know, what have you written in the past and kind of what's your, uh, yeah, what's your kind of association with writing? So, so, um, my writing goes all the way back to my university days. I attended the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I studied Russian literature. So the big Russian giants, the Chekhovs, the Tolstoys, the Dostoevskys, that was, that was really my degree. And so that's where I really cut my teeth. Um, after that, and all of the writing that I did in college, the next writing that I did was um, I wrote for uh, the Denver Post. Uh, so I'm, I'm in Denver, Colorado, by the way. And uh, so I'd written for the Denver Post. I wrote book reviews and I wrote a few uh, uh, features for them. And then I moved to Italy and I worked as a tour guide in Italy. And while I was in Italy, I wrote I, I was a correspondent for the Denver Post. I wrote a couple of things for them. Uh, I wrote a couple of articles for a wire service called UPI. And when I was there, I actually ran into another author who wrote guidebooks for a publisher in Asia. And they interviewed me and wanted me to write a book about Rome and a book about Venice. And so the, that was the first book length things that I did was Insiders Rome and Insiders Venice which are uh, been out of print for a while, but uh, you can still see them listed on Amazon, on my Amazon page. And so that really got me into it. And then, um, and then I, I, I wrote The Reincarnationist Papers, and it took me a little over a year to write that. And my process 
for writing the reincarnations papers and for writing the sequel to that, which is done, uh, is to really write uh, and try to write a thousand words a day and just have a daily quote up and you know sometimes you get to seven or eight hundred and you're done some days you're at thirteen fourteen hundred and you're just in a groove and you keep going uh but you know overall trying to average a thousand words a day is my quota and when i can do that that's like a good day's work all right that's pretty great um so how it sounds like you've done a lot of writing. Um, was that kind of your strategy, that thousand words a day? Was that what you were looking at when you were writing the insider guide for um, Rome and Italy and things like that as well? Yeah, that was that was the that was my, my goal all the way back then. One of the things that you learn when you write for a newspaper, even though I didn't write, you know, I didn't write articles every day. I wasn't like a staff writer. I was more of a special contributor. Uh, you do have to work under a deadline. And, you know, when you say, when you talk to your editor and they say, oh, yeah, I want that book review in, but it's got to be done by Friday. We're going to make the Sunday paper, right? There's, there's no slipping notes, right? You have to get your work done. You have to get it done on time. And when the publisher, when Marshall Cavendish, who was my publisher for Insiders Roman Insiders Venice, uh, said, hey, we, we want this book done by this time so we can print it and have it available by a summer travel season. You know, you have to get that stuff done. So yeah, um, you know, when, when you're writing, it, I, I find that the process goes better if you just stick to a schedule. Um, you know, I, I think that it's, it's um, uh, I got some writing advice from Neil Gaiman, uh, author of um, American Gods, Coraline, those books. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he, this was actually on masterclass.com. He said that the perfect, I think it was him, said the perfect day for the writer is to be, is like Groundhog Day, where it's the same every day. You get into a routine over and over and over again. There's no distractions with relatives coming over. There's no distractions with friends that want to have dinner. You just are able to get in your zone, get into a rhythm, get your 1,000, 1,200 words a day done day after day. And I think that's, you know, the more that I listen to him, the more I think he's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That, you, that routine of saying, hey, even if it's not yeah, good, routine. whatever I'm getting down today, <laughs> that routine, yeah, routine is really important. Yeah. Cool. Um, so how long did you have the idea for the Reincarnationist Papers before you actually started, hey, let's let's actually do this. Let's sit down and start writing. So I had the idea for not that long, actually, before I started writing it down. Um, and, and I, um, so, and we'll, we'll get into the ideas in a second, but I, I've, Whenever I get an idea, I find that I absolutely have to write them down and capture them into notes because they will sort of float away on you, right? And if you don't capture them, and I can tell because when I go back and I look at some of the notes of things that I wrote a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago, they're not in my head anymore. And uh, if I hadn't written them down, they'd be gone forever. So it was a probably less than a year before, uh, you know, uh, I got the, the sort of the first two ideas that were the kernel of the book and the inspiration for the book before I started writing the first draft and sort of outlining uh, the overall structure of the book. Hmm. Okay. And, and what were, what were the kernels? Like what were those kind of starting ideas? So because the book is about, one of the themes in the book is reincarnation. People that, that remember their past lives and they do that over and over and over again. So this allows me to explore the development of these characters back into history over a longer timeline than you can with normal characters, right? Who are gonna live, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 years uh, long. So, um, so th the first inspiration was, and it's this age old saying, and Matthew, you probably heard other people say it, oh my gosh, if I only knew then what I know now, mm -hmm. I would have done something differently. I would have made better decisions. I would have made different choices. And we usually hear that in the context of somebody who's 50 years old or 60 years old or 70 years old. But then I took that idea to an extreme and I thought, well, since if you could have characters that could reincarnate, what would it be like if you had someone who had the wisdom of 180 years, like three 60 year lifespans in a 20 year old body? 
What would that be like? What decisions would they make? What choices would they make? And I thought, wow, that would be a really interesting set of characters to write about. And I think that it was. Um, so that was one. The second was, um, I actually have three memories that don't belong to me. And, you know, it's, it, it is really interesting. They're very short. Um, and, you know, the shortest one's about five seconds. The longest one's about 30 seconds. But they're as real as anything that's ever happened to me. They're just like a regular memory, except that they predate me. The oldest one goes back to like 1870, uh, 1870s, I think. And the most recent one is like 1940s. And so that got me thinking, what would it be like if you didn't just have like just little snippets of memory, but what happens if you could remember every single thing, right? Everything that you ever did, everything that you ever learned, every person that you ever met, every conversation that you had, every language that you learned, uh, skill that you picked up, every bit of wisdom that you picked up, what would that be like? And then you accrue that lifetime over lifetime as you're reincarnated over and over again in new bodies and you can remember everything. Those two things together were really the genesis of the reincarnationist papers. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I, I really like, especially that first idea that um, this idea of what, what, is, what does it turn someone into if they can over and over and over again keep remembering with perfect recall, um, you know, kind of everything from their past. Uh, and it, I think you're right. It did create such uh, incredible characters. They're so interesting just to think about. And for me, I think I left the book like continuing to think about it um, because it's such an interesting oh, idea. It's good. I love hearing that because that's one of the things that I like to do. Um, because the, you know, because of the way that the, their lives are structured, you know, after you remember so many past lives and remember that you remembered your past lives, you will eventually, you would eventually build up a confidence that you would be in reincarnated again, mm -hmm. that you would remember who you were as Matthew Schaefer in a new body. And after you had done that a few times and built up that confidence, would death really bother you that much? Yeah, not at all. Probably not, right? But, so so that's one of the things where it sort of breaks down the walls of mortality in your personal development and in the development of these characters. The second is, if you just keep coming back over and over again, if you're reincarnated into a new body each time, and there doesn't seem to be any pattern, there doesn't seem to be any you know, benefit if you, if you, so if, in, if, if in your last life, you were a really selfless person, very altruistic, you lived for, you know, the benefit of others and you come back and your life is the same. And then your counterpart in the secret society lives a very selfish, hedonistic life, uh, does bad things at the expense of others. And that person just reincarnates and comes back and there's no difference. You would eventually learn that there's no benefit to leading a virtuous life and there's no detriment to leading a selfish hedonistic life. So that really breaks down the walls of morality for these characters. And once you break that down, what kind of choices would you make as a character if there were no consequence for bad actions and no incentive for good actions? What would your actions be? Yeah. And that's really what happens to these characters as they're reincarnated over and over on a longer timeline with no spirituality attached to the reincarnation. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit more about that. So as you're as you're planning these characters out, um, they seem to each have there. I think there's obviously our main character. And then there are three characters from the society that that are kind of uh, secondary characters. I suppose they play a major role. Um, I felt like each of those characters kind of had a philosophy attached to them a little bit, or or their character maybe had that philosophy, you know. And so I guess that's my question: which one came first, their philosophy or the character themselves, or were they, were they, you know, how did you kind of develop those characters out? So, um, so uh, we're talking about three characters: uh, Poppy, 
yes. Samus and Clovis. That's right. Sorry, and I should name them. the characters. Yeah, that's fine. We can talk about that because they're actually some of them are actually listed on the back of the book, so that's fine. Oh, um, and if you go to the Wikipedia page for the Reincarnations papers, you can see all the characters there. So that's not really a spoiler. But uh, you know, Evan is our main character, and he's coming into this as a as 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 completely new. He knows that or believes that he's one of them, that he's really different than a normal human being and that he has the recall of these past lives. But he doesn't quite know what he is. And he knows that he doesn't belong anywhere now. He doesn't fit in anywhere. And so he hopes that he fits into this new peerage in the secret society. So he really embraces the idea of being invited in and, be, and, and welcoming the task of passing their tests their initiation into their society once they can prove that he is one of them. But then he sort of gets three different guides in the book. And those three different guides sort of land him on three different potential squares for on the on the board of where that reincarnated life, that multiple life, that, that sort of longer timeline would lead you on. One is a very sort of sensualist existence. One is a very uh, sort of selfish and self-centered existence and, uh, and with, that, that has some ambition tied to it. And the third is like a really sort of spiritual and, and sort of, uh, you know, a transcendental kind of guide. And then, you know, Evan gets exposed to each of those and then, and then sort of realizes where you know, where his desires lie uh, between those three paths. So back to your original question. Uh, I knew that I wanted to explore these three different facets, but I didn't know how deep each one of these would go until I actually had the characters. So I sort of, you know, it's, it's like if you have an architectural drawing. So, so one of the questions that I think you want to get into is whether... I'm a pantser or a plotter uh, kind of writer. Uh, I'm very much a plotter kind of writer. But even when you're a plotter, um, that, that, that actually leaves, still leaves you a lot of room for creativity and a lot of room for the characters to actually grow in ways that you hadn't planned on and that are really very organic and very interesting. And that certainly happened with Poppy and that certainly happened with Clovis. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so you mentioned uh, pantser versus plotter. Some people may not know. Um, do you want to just explain what the difference is between a pantser and a plotter? Yeah, I actually prefer a different uh, analogy to this, and it's the okay. analogy that George R. R. Martin uses, and we all know him, right? He's, wrote, he's written, you know, the Game of Thrones uh, books. Um, <clears throat> uh, a a a, a, a plotter is someone who has an outline and a structure in their mind for how they want the story to progress, the hero's journey, some of the subplots, uh, the overall plot of the book. Uh, and then the pantser is someone who just basically just jumps in and follows an idea very organically. Uh, George R. R. Martin calls those two styles the architect and the gardener. And I'm very much an architect. So when I start, I want to know that this thing is going to be a building that looks, you know, this tall, this wide, but there's still room in there for uh, different, uh, the, for, for the rooms to look different, for the floor plans to look different, for the ceiling height to expand or contract, uh, whereas the gardener is very much just you know, you plant a seed, you don't even know what the seed is, and then something comes up and it's very organic and it's beautiful or it's ugly and you've got to trim it or nurture it in some way. And so I'm very much an architect kind of writer. Okay. All right. So, you know, one, one thing I'm very interested in, because I already mentioned the descriptions I felt like in your book were such a, a huge strength of the book. Um, and some of those descriptions in particular are in the setting of the, of the, the novel. Um, and there's not just one setting, there's a lot of different settings. So I want to know kind of what does it look like for you to do your research uh, for these settings? Because they are so descriptive when, you know, when you're in Zurich, it feels like you're in Zurich. When it's LA, um, it's like, I feel like I'm actually in LA. And even places where, you know, obviously you weren't there, 
um, during the time periods in the past that you write about, but it still feels like actually you're writing descriptions of, it feels like you're standing right there. So I guess, what does your research look like? Some of it obviously comes from your well-traveled and so you've had the opportunity to visit some of these places, um, but some of them you couldn't have visited. So uh, do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, so there, there's actually, uh, there's actually two different questions in there. Um, number one is the research, and number two is sort of the the research for, uh, you know, getting the uh, let's just call it the, the the cinematic part of it right, uh, to borrow to borrow a movie term. Um, there is a ton of research in the book, and that's because uh, these characters reincarnate over and over again. And that gives us the opportunity to reach back in time for these characters and to explore them in their previous incarnations where they were a man, where they were a woman, where they were tall, where they were short, where they were in different races, and, and explore their character development through history. So some of the characters are placed in 17th century France. Some of the characters are placed in 16th century American Southwest with conquistadors. Some of the characters are placed in the First World War. And it allows us to see character virtues, character flaws that might be centuries old that are only sort of manifest or re-manifest in the characters in the present day, when, when the book takes place in the present day. So when you go back and you place those characters in 17th century France, you've got to get it right. Um, you know, I, in addition to just writing, I read a lot and I really, um, I really appreciate when a writer uh, really does the research and really, um, uh, uh, and really takes you to that place. And, but on, on the flip side, I really tend to um, fall down when I'm a reader, when I'm reading something and I know that there's a piece of research that's not right or it's a little thin. It sort of makes me sort of squint my eyes at the rest of the book and sort of look at the rest of the things a little suspect. And I didn't want to be that writer who lost a reader because of just a lack of effort on the research front. So I really did do a ton of research on that. That's actually a lot of fun for me. I love history. I love researching history. And I like to make it as real as possible. Now, your second question, which was about the setting. And how do I get the setting right for, you know, uh, coastal Yemen? How do I get the setting right for Zurich? How do I get the setting right for... Uh, you know, uh, uh, inner city LA. Uh, wherever possible, I like to go there. And when that's not possible, what I like to do is I like to really immerse myself in like a movie or a series of movies that are set in that scene, specifically if they have like a really killer cinematographer. So like for the Yemen scene, I, you know, I, I'd been to Zurich, I'd been to LA, but I'd never been to Saudi Arabia or Yemen or even that part of the world. But I knew I had to get it right. And so you end up watching movies like uh, Lawrence of Arabia, The Sheltering Sky, uh, The English Patient, movies like that that are set in those scenes so that you can sort of see that in your head and then when you when I can see it in my head is when I can write it. And so I, I, I never really get writer's block. What I get is sort of thinker's block where I can't visualize something in my head. And then when I can't visualize it, I just know that I need to stop writing and I need to just think about it and visualize it. But, you know, like one of the things that I did in order to write the fire scene so well is I watched the movie Backdraft about 10 times. Hmm. And I don't know if you remember that film. It's it's uh, you know it's 20, 30 years old now. Kurt Russell, uh, uh, Ron Howard directed film. It's really a great film. But the cinematography around the fire in that film is just so dramatic. It really is like its own character in the film. And so I just watched that over and over again and until I could sort of get that right. And I hope that I did. Yeah, that's awesome. And it sounds like as, as, as you're writing, you know, you, you really grew upon one of your strengths, which is you kind of have this background in journalistic kind of reporting. And so you draw upon the research and, and being able to see some of those places in person. And um, it's cool that you're able to, to do that. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, it's 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 funny that <clears throat> the things that you do in the previous parts of your life tend to show up in the time when you need them. And this is actually this actually is is a parallel that I talk about uh, as it relates to the reincarnations papers because when you read the reincarnations papers there's a bit of fantasy and wish fulfillment in there because they're three lifetimes old, they're 12 lifetimes old, they're 20 lifetimes old. And you think, wow, it would be so cool to be that old and to have lived in that time and to be able to accrue these skills and these languages and to be, you know, such a, you know, super badass in a lot of ways because you have all of these skills and, and experiences that the normal people can't get in a 60, 70, 80 year old lifespan. And so it, it's really cool to fantasize about that. But we actually, we actually experience this ourselves in, in, in our lives because in our, in our limited lives of 60, 70, 80 years, we actually end up being different people in different parts of our lives. Mm. We end up being children, we end up being students, we end up being workers, we end up being uh, you know, parents and grandparents and hopefully retirees. And everything we do at those earlier stages ends up being a potential benefit for us in the stage that we're at or in the future stage in our lives. So for me, you know, studying Russian literature at university was sort of equipped me to write, uh, you know, a novel, a piece of novel length fiction like the Reincarnationist Papers. Uh, you know, working uh, and, and writing things for the Denver Post and for UPI allowed me to write very uh, efficiently and very concisely and get descriptions that would really, you know, jump off of the newsprint page at people. Um, and this is actually something that I've that I've sort of pursue and and uh, have pursued when I wrote the book. And there's actually a quote that I have on my desk here that really encapsulates that. And that's actually one of the lessons from the reincarnations papers that I think is applicable to all of us. I'll read this quote if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, Matthew. go ahead. It's from uh, a 19th century American spiritualist named Frederick Henry Hedge. Um, he was an associate of uh, R Ralph Waldo Emerson and Thoreau in New England and was one of the founders of the Transcendental Movement in the United States. And it's this quote, uh, every man is his own ancestor and every man his own heir. He devises his own future and he inherits his own past. So when people read my book and they think, oh, it would be so cool if I could have all these experiences from these previous things, they should be thinking about what their life is going to be like in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years and should be thinking and planning about what benefits they could be accruing now that they would leave to that 50 or 60 or 70 year old version of themselves as an inheritance. Hmm. Hmm. I love that idea. Just hey, what I'm doing now either benefits or hinders the me of tomorrow. That's it. And that person, that, that, you know, that 20 year old, you know, that 20 uh, years old, older version of Matthew Schaefer, that's in the mail to you. Yeah. Are you cool. going to do him a favor or are you going to do him a disservice? Hmm. Yeah. That's such a cool idea. Now, um, as you're, you know, a lot of people have an idea, a kernel of an idea for a book that they want to write. And some, sometimes you hear this, it's an excuse, but, uh, this excuse of kind of, Hey, I don't have time or I can't find the time in my day to write. I've got, you know, a job and I've got family and I've got hobbies and all these different things that, that take up my time. Um, what, what did you do or how, or what is maybe a helpful hint or tip for someone who's in that situation? Um, how do you get to saying, Hey, I can write a thousand words a day, um, you know, for the next 50 or 100, 100 days in a row and kind of create that routine. How, how do you kind of do that? Yeah, um, it's going to take, uh, you know, at the highest level, it's going to take focus and discipline. Uh, at, but, at, you know, but that, that sounds like a platitude without the exact instructions on how to do it. And I have some exact instructions on how I do it. Uh, hobbies, out the window. They're on hold for as long as you want to write. This is your hobby, right? Uh, number two, 
if you if you drink a lot or if you party or if you do recreational drugs those will hinder your ability to think and i think it was um um there's a famous writer oh my god i've got this written down and um i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, shoot i've lost who it is but but their quote is that writing is concentrated thinking so you need to equip yourself to be the best possible thinker that you can get a good night's sleep go to bed early uh, for me, if I if I drink the next day, I'm a wreck, and I just I'm not thinking right. I don't perform well. Um, so stay clean because that'll make you uh, the best thinker, and the, and the clearer thinker you are, the better writer and the faster writer you're going to be. Mm -hmm. Next is get up in the morning early. I get up at five o'clock in the morning, and I write for three hours before I get ready to go to work. And that time is my own. Nobody else encroaches on that time. Uh, but it takes going to bed a bit earlier and it takes some discipline and getting up. But that time is, is time that you allocate for yourself and for your art. And writing is going to take time. There's no shortcuts there. It takes concentrated thinking. It takes long periods of time when you can think about what you want to write about, where you spend time alone with your own imagination, and then you put it down on paper. And you just get out that first draft. That's the most important thing. And maybe you can't do a thousand words a day. Try to do 500 words a day. Try to do 400 words a day at the beginning. It's like a muscle. The more you do it, the more you'll be able to do it. Like when I started this novel, this the second novel, I started off at 800 words a day. By about halfway through, I was at 1,200 words a day. And near the end, I was cranking out 15, 1,600 words a day. Right? You just get stronger the more you do it. But make time to do it and then do it every day. Every day. No excuses. Hmm. Wow. So it sounds like a big part of it is you kind of prioritize. You say, hey, this is this is my new number one priority and everything this else. This is my new hobby. This is the new most important thing in my life. Yeah. It's not going out with, with the, the guys to go watch the Denver Nuggets and drink beer, right? Because that will take away from what you're able to do at 5 a.m. the next morning. Yeah. Well, and not only that, but it also takes away from that day as well. Potentially, you might be losing two days if you go party that night or whatever. That's so exactly it. That's exactly it. That, that, that's, that's, that's what works for me. Yeah. Yeah. So you end up sacrificing all of those other things that are that are important. Maybe maybe you enjoy those things. You say for a time we're not going to do those because we've got a new most important thing. Exactly. So when I'm when I'm writing, uh, you know, I like to fish. Um, if I can fish in the afternoon for a little bit, I will, but I don't get up in the morning and fish. I get up and I write. Yeah, yeah. Um, so tell me about, you've got your first draft down maybe, and you're starting into kind of the editing process. What does that look like for you? Are you a self-editor? Do you kind of, you know, uh, Jenkins talks about uh, being a voracious self-editor. Do you start that way or what does that kind of look like for you? Yeah, so, um, so this is actually a very complicated question that well, we can spend a, a lot of time exploring this. So I end up being my own first editor, my own second editor, probably my own third and fourth editor, but I'm not my only editor. And this is a very important thing. Um, I, I got a really great piece of writing advice from, uh, of all people, Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, not that I met Jerry Seinfeld, but I heard Jerry Seinfeld on Tim Ferriss's podcast. Uh, and I listened to Tim Ferriss's podcast. And Jerry Seinfeld said, when you're writing, you have to have two really different personalities. You have to have a personality that can get the first draft down on the page. And that is a personality that really is very supportive, very positive, very confident. Um, you know, you can do it. Just get it done. And then once that's done and on the first page and on the page, you come back the next day, metaphorically the next day, it could be weeks later or months later, and you're the editor you. And the editor you is basically uh, like Lou Gossage Jr., the drill sergeant from an officer and a gentleman, right? That is just like the most difficult, demanding taskmaster that will just take a look at things critically and say, oh, this is good, this is good, this is crap, this is crap, this is crap, this is crap, it needs more work. And you have to be ruthless when you're the editor and you have to have what Salman Rushdie calls a good BS detector. 
and BS means, you know, like when you write it and you're like, oh yeah, this is good enough, but it's not good enough. But you can't do that when you're writing. In, in, when you're writing, you've got to be that totally super positive, supportive person that just says, yeah, I'm the best ever, and then do it and then let the drill sergeant, uh, you know, put on the drill sergeant hat and then you kick your own butt the next day uh, and make sure that it's good. Now, that's what I tend to do over three or four or five drafts. And then it's very important that you start to let other people read it. And that's important for two reasons. Number one, they will read it as readers and not writers. And they will tell you, oh, hey, your writing style broke down here. Or I really struggled with the descriptions that weren't in the book here. And they will give you feedback on how to improve it. And, that, and that'll be feedback that you wouldn't necessarily be able to see yourself or to give yourself, even with that drill sergeant hat on. Um, and then lastly, I do recommend that all authors, whether they traditional publish or whether they self-publish, that they have, that they engage a professional editor to help them with the book. Uh, you know, I self-published the book in 2009 and it went through a really interesting journey to get to Paramount. Um, but then once it got to Paramount, I then got a traditional publishing deal with Blackstone Publishing that published it in, in uh, paperback, audiobook, and ebook. And we worked together with, uh, with one of the staff editors they have. And Matthew, I was alarmed at, at different stages. I was alarmed, concerned, and then horrified at all the mistakes that were in my self-published edition that got cleaned up when I worked with a professional editor. It is a real profession, a real skill, a real art, and they're there to make your books better. And you need to use them, otherwise you run the risk of putting an inferior piece of work in front of your potential readers and you only have one chance to make a first impression like it seems like i made a good impression with you and hopefully i make a good impression with the people that 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 view this uh the view this interview together uh don't put your stuff out there with avoidable errors and you can avoid the errors by having other people help you edit the work yeah, well, and it's just like what you mentioned earlier, when you say, hey, a piece of research is off, then you get your squinty eyes for the rest of the book. I mean, if, if you're in the first few chapters and you see one mistake, you go, oh, I'm squinting a little bit. But if you see a second mistake, I mean, your squinty eyes come on for the rest of the book and you're, ah, this isn't, this isn't done well. You know, that's what you Yeah, mean. yeah, exactly, exactly. And I had that feedback in hindsight, uh, you know, that people told me that, but I didn't, I didn't see it because I was my own editor. Yeah. When you have another editor, Man, that's that that can really take it to the next level. Yeah, yeah, great advice. Now, uh, you said you spent about a year writing your your kind of first edition of this. How long did you spend um, actually editing? Uh, I guess before you self published, and then and then you know you've, you've gone through a second editing process. How long did that kind of take between those two different um, sets of editing? Uh, well, there's sort of two different answers there. There's sort of the calendar time and then there's the elapsed time that i worked on it uh the calendar time is um like 20 years uh mm -hmm. if you consider right uh, ever all the work that i did up until the traditionally published edition with blackstone that came out on may 4th right there was a lot of you know because we had to go back and redraft and rework a lot of things in the book so i was actually working on it up until january of of this year um but I'd started writing the first draft and, and capturing the first things around the book uh, back to the, 19, the late 1990s. So uh, it's been a long time. But, but in there, like it took me a, a year, maybe a little over a year to get the first draft down. And then um, I picked it up again in earnest in 2007, 2008, and I redrafted the book a couple of times and I got it into what I felt was pretty good shape and a good enough shape to self-publish it. And then I self-published it in 2009. And then it was, uh, and then it stayed in that state until um, probably 2019 
when uh, I engage with my existing publisher, my current publisher, to uh, to come up with this new version, the version that that actually uh, became adapted into the motion picture Infinite, starring Mark Wahlberg, that'll be out this summer. All right, and and so I think um, one thing that people. Yeah, and I've gotten a sense of this, of the answer to this question already. Um, but people think, hey, if I get out my, if I write this thing and then I hire a professional editor, then they'll kind of edit the work for me and I don't have to work anymore. You know what I mean? Um, there's sometimes that sense that if, if that's their job, they should be editing, then they need to edit it. Um, but, but there's a sense you're giving me, which is very different than that, which is actually they do, they do their work and then they send it back to you and you have to work some more. Well, there's different kinds of editors, right? There are developmental editors who will take an idea that is maybe 80 or 90% there and they'll say, oh yeah, I read your book, but it's thin in this area. You've got way too much in this area. And they'll sort of help you with the overall character development, plot line development, story arcs, things like that. And then there are, and I always get these confused the between line editors and copy editors. Uh, but basically, they're the ones that go and take a look at the punctuation, the spelling, the exact word usage, sentence structure, and they, they're basically sort of like the fine tooth comb that goes over it and takes out all the mistakes. But uh, that's the one that I, absolutely rec that I absolutely mandate that most people do, is have that editor that takes out all the mistakes. But you, because you can get the other sort of editorial feedback by just sharing your, you know, once you feel like you have a draft that you're proud enough of and confident enough in to share with beta readers, that they'll just tell you, oh, hey, I liked the book up until this point, and then when this character made this decision, I'm like, what? Yeah, what happened here? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then you go back and you work on your development, and then you get it to where people are raving about it and saying, hey, I love this book. It's got a bunch of typos and a bunch of, you know, uh, you know, punctuation <laughs> errors. But that's what that other professional is for. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, you know, because I, I still employ beta readers and even an alpha reader for, 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 my, for my new stuff. And, they, and they'll give you feedback to say, oh, this character, I really like this character. You should have developed this character more. I didn't understand what you were doing over here in this flashback. And then that helps you sort of hammer the thing into the right shape where people will read it and enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, great. Cool. And, and just, uh, just for people who may not know, um, do you use beta readers as people that you personally know? Or are they um, a beta readers as someone who reads through an, an early manuscript of your book, right? Um, so it's typically people that I know and uh, that I know read. Um, it, 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 it helps if they, it helps if I have a relationship with them because number one, I can ask them, hey, did you get that done yet? Did you get that done yet? Did you get that done yet? Um, number two, a real uh, good trait of a beta reader is someone who reads a lot uh, because they'll be able to compare you against basically the marketplace, right? To say, oh, this stuff is as good as Dan Brown, or oh, this stuff needs to be as good as Aaron Morgenstern, and it's not, it's below that, right? Mm -hmm. Those are really invaluable helpers uh, to help you get the thing where you want it to be and where it actually needs to be to be commercially viable. Um, so um, so I, I, some of my beta readers are my friends that, that, have been, that, are, that are voracious readers. Others are really avid fans who uh, have read the book, love the book, and are really, uh, really, you know, when when I'm in a, when I'm when I'm talking with them and they pick up really specific, very nuanced things, I sort of put a mental cue, a, a cue that oh, this person might be a good beta reader to read, you know, an advanced version of something before it actually goes to press. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Now, um, as far as thinking about, you know, maybe you've gone through this process, you've started, you've got your paper done, your, uh, your first kind of draft of, of a book done, and you feel like, hey, I've, I've gone through some of this editing process, I've maybe sent it to beta readers and gotten stuff back, and I'm, and I'm thinking about publishing now. Um, I guess the question of, you've now gone through the self-publishing process and the more traditional publishing process, um, I guess, how... Did you know that you were going to self-publish to begin with? Did you try to contact traditional publish, publishers first back in 2009 um, when you first got this out? And kind of what was that process for you? Yeah, I did try to traditionally publish first. Um, and, um, you know, surprise, uh, it's hard out there. Uh, and it's really hard to 
get an agent. It's harder when you get an agent to get a publisher. Uh, I did get an agent and we did try to shop it around, but without success. Uh, at the end of the day, wherever you are in this process, uh, realize there's rejection and there's rejection for everybody. Uh, even the, you know, the JK Rowlings and the James Pattersons of the world were rejected. And I hope that there is a special ring of hell for those publishers and those acquisitions editors who passed on those works, right? And that they're being tortured down there right now. <laughs> uh, um, but it happens to all of us, right? But I kept hearing from my readers, from my early readers, that the book was really good, that they really loved it. They really loved the world that I created with these reincarnationist characters that reincarnate over and over again. They really loved the secret society and the way that these guys had been operating behind the scenes of our history for centuries. And they just, it, it's one of the, it's crazy. One of the funny things that all my early readers told me was, I totally see this as a movie. This is such a movie. And as the author, I never really saw it as a movie until, um, until it actually started to become a movie. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is a movie. <laughs> Yeah. So how many times did you actually, you know, kind of get rejected? Do you have a, a count of what that looks like? Oh, oh, it's, I, you know what? I have a file downstairs. It's over a hundred. Yeah. It's yeah. And I, and I think that's pretty typical, isn't it? In the I industry. think it is too. I think it is too. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, and it, I, I think that it even happens with people who, you know, uh, you know, I've published a lot of things. You know, you come up with an idea and the publisher and the agent's like, eh, I don't know if you should write that or that's, I don't think you can sell that, right? Mm. You know, and then there are the, you know, then there are the Dan Browns, the James Pattersons that write children's books as well and they're phenomenally successful as well. So who knows? Yeah. It's a weird industry, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and so do you feel like self-publishing was a, um, a, a lesser form of publishing? Like, do you recommend that people not self-publish now that you've done it? Do you feel like it's something, you know, yeah, I guess uh, maybe talk a little bit around, around the idea. Yeah, so I am a huge fan of self-publishing. I'm a huge fan of traditional publishing, and I believe that you should try to get traditionally published. But I believe that if you write well, and if you have a story that others want to read, that traditional publishing and the rejection that comes along with that should no longer be a blocker to you getting in front of readers. And we live in an amazing time as writers in that we have all of this infrastructure now that can work around traditional publishing and put you in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of readers. And that is self-publishing, whether you do it through Ingram Spark, whether you do it through Amazon KDP, whether you do it through Draft to Digital, who, you know, whatever path you want to take to do that with. And I really don't have a preference. I've used all of them at one point or another. The keys are write the story that you want to write, get it edited, get it edited, get it edited, right? To make sure that it's as good as other things that readers will be reading day to day. And they're gonna be reading things that are on the shelf at your local bookstore. And if your stuff is not as good as the stuff that's on the local bookstore, it will show and your readership will suffer. But there's nothing preventing a, a, an author like me, an author like you, an author like, Andy Weir, an author like E.L. James, who both, you know, who all three of us started with self-publishing and putting stuff in front of readers, and then readers liked it and voted with their dollars, voted with their eyes, and voted with the recommendations to get it to a wider audience, and then boom, you're traditionally published, right? All of a sudden, these people that have been telling you no for years are knocking on your door asking for <laughs> what you've got next, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, the, 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 the most important people in the cycle of author, agent, publisher, and reader, the most important people are the readers. Because readers will, you know, they'll, they'll read it and they'll love it 
or they'll read it and they'll hate it. And, you know, like you read my book and loved it and you contacted me and now, you know, dozens or hundreds or even thousands of people are going to see this because you liked my book and were an evangelist for it and have voted with your opinion for people to go out and buy this book, right? Yeah. There's nothing that prevents anyone from getting their book in front of readers the same way that I got my book in front of you. Yeah. Now, this actually ties in great to this idea of actually getting it to a movie as well, right? Because you um, have talked before about how you basically crowdsource your readers. And that's exactly what you're talking about here is, is using the people who read your book, who like your book to kind of get it out to other people. And so can you tell us a little bit about, um, I, I mean, how you marketed to get it to where it's now, a, 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 you know, where it's infinite, the movie that's coming out later this year? Yeah. Yeah, I, I will. Let, let me let me go back to the examples of Andy Weir and E.L. James, right? E.L. James wrote, wrote uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, but she started as writing fan fiction around uh, the, you know these uh, these other books, but it was so good that and she self published it that people loved it. And they just kept wanting more and more. And she's, you know, a very prolific writer and, and, and was able to satisfy those readers. And eventually publishing came to her and said, hey, let's, you know, let's, let's do a big book. And you talk about big books, Fifty Shades of Grey, giant book, jeepers, mm -hmm. right? Same with Andy Weir, right? He self-published The Martian and was writing it chapter uh, after chapter and posting it on his website. And then he put it all together uh, on Amazon and sold it as a book for 99 cents. And people loved it. And they just kept buying it and buying and buying it. Pretty soon it was like, you know, the number one bestseller in its category on Amazon to the point where publishers took notice of them and said, hey, we need to, we need to do a traditional publishing deal on this. Um, so what I did is I embraced the feedback that my readers were giving me, that the book is good, that people love the book, they wanted more of the book. And what I thought, I actually borrowed a, a sort of some tricks from my day job. Um, I work in Silicon Valley in IT. And one of the things that we do is we routinely ask our end users, our readers or end users or customers for help. And one of the things that I did is since I'd already decided that I was ready to engage with an agent and pay an agent's commission to make an introduction to a New York publisher or a Hollywood producer that would take the reincarnations papers to a wider audience. I said, well, why can't I do that with my readers? Mm -hmm. So what I did, this is actually the self-published edition of the reincarnations papers. And you can see at the top there, it actually says promotional edition. And in the promotional edition on the first page is a reward it says reward right there and the reward is was a reward to readers and I basically offered all of my early readers a reward of the agents Commission if they would read the book and if they enjoyed the book if they would then introduce the book to anybody that they knew in Hollywood or in publishing where that introduction could lead to a book deal or a movie deal where the reincarnations papers goes to a wider audience. And so if it, if it landed in a movie deal, I would pay that reader the same commission that I would pay an agent for making that introduction if the deal mm. happened. And then I priced it as low as I could on Amazon, just like Andy Weir did. And I just tried to send as many copies as I could into the world. And it seems like, you know, kind of a crazy message in a bottle marketing idea uh, up until it works. And then when it works, it seems like it's genius, like it was meant to work the whole time, right? I didn't know that it would work the whole time, but when it did work, I was like blown away. And then it did work because there was uh, an assistant to a Hollywood director that found a copy of this book in a hostel in Nepal and read it just picked it up and read it and saw my reward and he contacted me and he's like dude i just read this book this could be a really killer movie has anybody claimed the reward yet and so nobody had so he picked it up and championed it and it took him several years but he eventually got it uh, adapted into the into the motion picture infinite and got it made got it sold to paramount and now it's going to be, you know, now it's going to be released as a Paramount movie this summer starring Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, that's 
really, really cool. I think that's something that uh, if you're self-publishing, this is, I mean, take the page literally right out of your book, right? And I mean, that's- Well, they, like they can, book. and actually I'll give it to them because actually on my website, uh, ericmykrantz.com, there's actually a reward section on there that talks about the reward story. And there's actually a link to the exact text that I used on the reward in the book. And, you know, if you want to use it, feel free to use it, please- Give me credit for it and call it the My Crans Reward. That would be that would sort of be a nice footnote to history if this yeah. becomes like a new way that people uh, get their book in front of industry professionals. Yeah, well, and, that, and there's no reason why not, right? If you've written a story, you've spent the time to make sure it's actually a good story, it's edited and it's gone through. I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't uh, use it. Uh, you know, kind of the same the My Crans Reward. Put it in there and uh, <laughs> yeah. make it a new thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's cool. Um, so you've got this movie deal that's kind of coming into place. How much input did you have in the process of, of making the movie? Uh, not a lot. Um, and, and you have to sort of appreciate as an author that, you know, uh, listen, this book is 125,000 words. This is a big book. It's 400 and some pages. You read this book, you're going to spend 15 or 20 hours with me as the author, um, Paramount Pictures got to get it done in 120 minutes, full stop, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, th they have to do things in movies that, um, uh, to make a movie work, whereas a book gets a lot more latitude. So there are things that are, you know, that I think have been taken out of the movie. There are things that have been added into the movie, but I think that they get the overall structure of, you know, the message of the book right that the people reincarnate over and over again they live on a longer timeline they're actors and drivers to history there's a secret society of these people they tend to skew in different directions when they get to live and mature and develop over a longer timeline there are nihilists there are hedonists there are sensualists there are you know religious zealots um and so uh, that seems to track pretty well to this. But no, uh, once you sell your, uh, you know, once you have a movie option and then they execute the movie option and they start writing a script and they start bringing in actors and directors and producers, each of which that have their own sort of opinions and flavor on where it goes, uh, your job is pretty much to cash the check and to uh, do whatever PR they want you to do at the back end. And yeah. um, I'm happy to do both of those. Okay. Have you actually seen the movie yet? I have not. Okay. All right. So well, uh, I, I was I was invited out to see the movie uh, by by the producers, but that was before COVID hit, and then that's actually you know that scrambled a lot of things in Hollywood. As you know, we haven't been to I haven't been to movie theater in over a year. Okay. Right? Uh, most of us haven't. So it's really been a disruption to the industry. Um, but you know, they invited me out to see it and everybody that I've met and, and, uh, you know, interacted with in Hollywood has just been amazing. Uh, the producers, the screenwriter, the director, uh, I've met Mark Wahlberg. They're all just amazing folks. Oh, that's really cool. Wow. That's kind of the dream, isn't it? But you're yeah. waiting in anticipation with the rest of us to see the movie. Yeah. Yeah. It really has been, it really has been a dream with, a lot of work. It may seem like an overnight success story, but it actually took over a decade, right, yeah. for this for this to happen. But it's been amazing, and uh, it's been tremendously rewarding, and it's been very satisfying, and it's I've just got to meet the coolest people along the way. Hmm. Very cool. Well, I want to be respectful of your time, so kind of uh, last kind of series of questions here. I'd love to hear about the next books that are coming out. You said you've got book two and book three coming. So I so there will be at least three books in the series. Okay. Uh, probably there could be there are probably more, but I've got one. I've got the second book written. It's uh, we talked about editing before. It's actually it's gone through six edits. I'm on wow. the seventh edit now, uh, and it's only been edited by me. And I've had my alpha reader, uh, it's my wife, read it. Uh, and then after the seventh draft, it'll probably go to beta readers and then probably go through one more draft on my side. And then it'll be ready for me to share with my agent, my publisher to hopefully be out in 20, late 2022. And then, uh, and then I have, uh, at least one more book in the series that has been, 
uh, outlined. Like I said, I'm, a, I'm an architect, I'm a plotter, not a band or a gardener, right? Um, uh, but there's, there's, there's opportunity for other books in the series. Okay, awesome. And can you tell us anything about um, book two and book three, I guess? Are they the same characters? Do we get to come back to some of the same settings? Uh, yeah, this, so we get we get to go back to the same secret society. We get to come back to some of the same characters. There are a couple of new characters, and then there um, there could be some um, uh, an, an additional sort of family or secret society that is tied mm -hmm. to someone who was kicked out of the secret society a long time ago. Okay. All right, that's really cool. So that's exciting. We get to some of the same characters, some of the same situation, but a kind of a new twist with a whole nother secret society as well. Yeah, yeah. All right. Wow, well, that's awesome. Well, Eric, thank you so much for coming on and talking with us. A lot of really invaluable advice for anyone who's thinking about writing or is in the process of writing or editing a book. Um, just really, really appreciate you just taking the time and, and some of your wisdom and experience. Yeah, thanks. And I'm just, you know, listen, I'm, I'm just getting started in this as well. I've been working at it for a while. But, you know, uh, in some ways, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a newbie and I'm just getting started. But it's been it's been a real fun hour with you guys. Uh, please, like Matthew, please uh, pick up a copy of the Reincarnationist Papers and enjoy it. Uh, and uh, email me your feedback. Like, go to my website, ericmikranz.com. Um, uh, the last name is spelled M-A-I-K-R-A-N-Z. And uh, there, uh, I, 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 I have my email there. You can actually email me your thoughts about the book. If you're in a book club, please pick the Reincarnationist Papers as a book club uh, pick. And the month after you read it, uh, you can book me for an hour and I will join your book club via Zoom. We're all uh, Zoom experts at this point. Uh, I will join your book club for an author interaction and talk back for an hour if you guys read the Reincarnationist Papers. Awesome. Well, I'll go ahead and drop your um, website and your email in the description as well. Make it a little bit easier to find. And yeah, take them up on that offer. That's such a huge thing to have the author be able to come sit in on your book club and, and talk with you about it. Um, I really encourage you guys to go ahead and pick up the book um, and take them up on that offer. That would be a really, really cool experience. Right on. Thanks, Matthew. It's been a real pleasure to spend the hour with you. All right. Appreciate it, Eric.